Hi everybody, my name is Ellie Matthews and I am a pencil reading volunteer from Belmont University and today I'm going to be reading to you guys from one of my favorite books called The Giant Golden Book of Elves and Fairies and the story that I'm going to read to you guys today is called Singley's Silver Slippers. Singley's Silver Slippers, translated from the Swedish by Martha Inez Johnson. Around the cottage in the dim twilight stood the youngest little elves in the forest. They tried to look through the window pane at Singley, who sat on a little footstool beside her father, Martin the shoemaker. She was sewing rose pink boots for her rag doll and was working surprisingly hard at it. Not for a single moment did she look up, so she did not see the curious little elves. Nor did she see the wicked trolls far away at the edge of the forest. The trolls were staring and staring, trying to discover why the elves were watching singly. Martin the shoemaker looked up for a moment from his work and rested his eyes on his little daughter's bent head. Very little of this world's goods and riches had he ever been able to give her. That she might own one lovely thing, one thing of beauty. He had given her a rare name, singly. He rose and stirred the fire on the hearth. The flames flickered and their light fluttered into the dark corners of the little cottage. Martin the shoemaker stood by the fire waiting as he did often. He expected that something of all the beauty and happiness in the great world would find its way through his doorway to his little daughter. But Singley was 10 years old and still the fairy of fortune had not shown so much as the points of her silver slippers in the cottage at the edge of the forest. Martin softly hummed an old song about a maiden who danced in silver slippers over rose-covered meadows. Hmm, rather better than these little cloth boots I'm making for my doll, remarked Singley cheerfully. Suddenly the door was pulled open and the shoemaker's wife entered from the goat stable with a pan of milk. Are you standing there singing foolish little rhymes, she said sourly. You had better make a pair of wooden shoes for Singley. Martin seated himself meekly on his three-legged stool, but when his wife had left the room, he pulled out a goatskin that gleamed like silver. Singly, he said, you shall be as lovely as the maiden in the song. You shall have silver slippers. But father, answered Singley, looking up from her sewing, you will never be able to finish them. Mother won't think it is foolish. Even so, I shall make them. And when Martin the shoemaker's wife came into the room again, Martin was busy with the silver slippers. Now that is a stupid thing to be doing, she exclaimed. Why make such trash for the child when she needs wooden shoes? But her voice was not stern. It was a marvelous thing to her how much Martin the shoemaker loved his little daughter. When the rose pink boots for her doll were finished, Singley said goodnight to her parents. Her mother too, tired with the day's work, went to rest. But Martin sat far into the night beside the flickering embers, working at the little silver slippers. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Martin the shoemaker went to open it, and there stood the fairies of fortune on the doorstep. They came into the room in a long line, and they all bent over the half-finished little slippers, stroking the smooth leather with loving hands as they whispered, Little slippers, only go on bright roads, only on good roads, only on right roads. Then the fairies went to the little bed where Singley lay sleeping in rosy dreams and said, if you, dear child, go astray, silver slippers will vanish away. All this was seen and heard by the elves who had slipped into the cottage through the half-open door. They had crept into the very edge of Singley's little bed, sitting there. They could easily watch the radiant fairies of fortune. But the house Tompte, who guards the little Swedish home, stood near the door to see that no wicked trolls entered. Now and then, he let these ugly creatures peep in. A father's love will be rewarded, said the fairies to one another. And softly, as they had entered, they disappeared, with the small, curious elves at their heels and the trolls clumping along behind. Martin the shoemaker brushed his hands over his eyes. Had he been dreaming? But he looked at Singley's slippers and saw that they were now real silver, soft as silk. The slippers were finished by St. Joanne's Eve, that evening, the elves were again looking through the window panes. But away at the edge of the forest sat the wicked trolls, wondering how they might steal the silver slippers without too much trouble, for they were always lazy fellows. In the little cottage stood the shoemaker's wife, hands on her hips, marveling at the beautifully finished slippers. 
Now these are a masterpiece, she said, but certainly our child can never wear them. Make her a pair of wooden shoes instead. So Martin the shoemaker made his daughter a little pair of wooden shoes. He fitted the little silver slippers to her feet first, and then he placed the wooden shoes over them. The elves, the trolls, and the house Tomte saw the silver gleaming when Singly walked, but humans only saw the rough wooden shoes. Singly ran over the mountain sides, uphill and downhill. She played with goats and kids. Once in a while, she lost her way in the great forest, and naturally she lost the shoes sometimes, even as the fairies had foretold. Then what a search there was, uphill and downhill, in the goat stables and the cottage. Often the house Tomte came dragging home with them after dark when Singly had gone to bed with tears and her long golden lashes. The years went by and Singly grew up. The silver slippers grew too and fitted her as well each year as when Martin the shoemaker had made them. When she was no longer a child, Singly found work on one of the king's estates in the middle of the great forest. Martin took her there. It was winter time and the snow laid like a warm blanket over fields and gardens. Toward evening, they saw the lights from the king's court and in the last turn of the road, they passed a whole procession of slaves. In the most beautiful one reclining, the young king wrapped warmly in a wolfskin coat and a bearskin blanket. The sleigh bells rang as though for a feast. Stop, cried the young king, but the driver did not stop until he reached the foot of the little hill. Wasn't there a gleam as if from silver shoes when that girl went by? Asked the young king. I didn't notice, said the driver, but the king sent a rider out. The messenger soon returned, saying that the girl they had passed only wore wooden shoes. Strange, muttered the young king, sinking down amongst his warm fur robes. It must have been a shining star that I saw falling in the distance. There had been a great fox hunt around the king's forest estate, and on this cold winter night, the hunters were on their way to the great city where his palace stood. Toward morning, all the sleighs had arrived. The king was called at once to sit in parliament. The wise old counselors asked him to find a queen for the country. Yes, answered the young king, smiling. When I meet a girl who goes swiftly as the hind to help in sorrow, as lightly as the wind to give joy, and as gently as the breeze in the linden tree. The wise old counselors shook their heads and thought the young king was making fun of them. Meanwhile, at the gateway of the king's estate in the great forest stood singly and waved farewell to Martin the shoemaker, who disappeared with dragging steps toward the highway. The silver slippers will guide her in the right way, he thought. Into them I have put all my love for her. No one in the king's estate ever noticed that the new servant girl wore silver shoes under her wooden ones, except the house Tomte, of course. The spring came, and the cattle had to be driven from the pastures, so Singly became the herd girl. Singing as she went, she drove the herds before her up the roadway. There was a fragrance of resin in the forest, and the back of fallen trees and large stones sat the trolls peeping at her. Large trolls and small trolls, they all saw the silver slippers under the wooden shoes, and they all wondered how to steal them from her. But the day was bright, and the trolls had to keep out of sight. Toward the evening, with golden coins and leafy branches twisted in their ugly hair, they clumped up to the gray shepherd's hut with the green thatched roof. On the step, Singly had placed her silver slippers, and they shone like two stars. With the ring of light around them, the trolls dared not come. There they stood and stretched out their long fingers toward the gleam of silver. Under the steps sat the house Tomte, looking out and shaking his fist at the ugly robbers. Don't you dare wake up the little one who sleeps alone in the great forest, he whispered. We shall not trouble her if only we may have the slippers, mumbled the trolls. Take them, laughed the house Tomte, but the trolls dared not step inside the ring of light around the shoes. The summer went by quickly. The butter tubs were filled and there were many cheeses because of the little herd girl was so diligent and careful. Never had the little herd hut Tomte helped as much as he had this year. And singly, wandering far over the pasture lands, never went astray. One evening near autumn, Singly sat on the steps of the shepherd's hut, knitting. She had taken off her wooden shoes, and the silver slippers shed a lovely light along the way. Strangely enough, not a single troll was to be seen. They were floundering about back in the marsh, laughing at a black horse that would not mind his master. On the back of the horse sat a rider, as pale as the little white elves who watched helplessly. The wicked trolls were pulling bits of turf and reed from under the horse's hoofs, so the black creature sank deeper into the marsh. Ho! cried the rider, but the only answer was an echo far, far away in the mountains. They sank deeper and deeper, the dark horse and the proud rider. Suddenly a swan's cry sounded. Singly jumped up, dropping her knitting, and ran in the silver slippers down to the marsh where the cry had come from. 
The rider heard her footsteps, quick as a hind's, light as the wind, gentle as a breeze in the linden tree. Had angels come to carry him away? No, it was only a herd girl. But she made a loop of the red band she had been knitting. Skipping from one bit of grassy turf to another, she threw the loop over the rider's head. All the little elves of the forest and pasture hurried forward, and with the red band, they pulled the rider up from the marshy water to dry ground. The elves carried him all the way to the step of the shepherd's hut. There he lay all night in a trance. When he awakened, the little herd girl had already driven the cattle out to pasture. Hunting horns sounded from the forest, and towards the hut came a large group of hunters. They lifted the rider onto one of their horses and rode carefully, slowly, toward the king's estate. In the evening, when the cows and goats came tinkling through the forest from the pasture land, Singly looked for the stranger, but all was quiet. No living being was to be seen. Singly, surprised, drove the cattle into the barn. That was an unthankful one, she said to herself. After several days, Singly and her animals left the pasture land for winter, and she drove her herd towards the village. In the twilight, they came to the king's estate. There were all lights in the windows, and inside was feasting and joy. Cows and sheep came to their usual winter barns, but no one had time for Singly, at least not at first. But soon she was called to help. The cook handed her a large plate with newly baked cakes, cream puffs they were, and Singly and her wooden shoes carried them into the dining hall. There were many young noblemen seated and fine ladies. Singly was so bewildered with all their splendor and richness that she stumbled. The plate fell to the floor, the cakes bobbed like balls around her, the wooden shoes slipped off, and there she stood wearing her silver slippers. At that moment, the most stately of all the young men arose. It was the young king. As an ornament, he wore a red band around his neck. Here is the one who goes as quickly as the hind, as lightly as the wind, and as gently as the breeze in the linden tree, he called. She must be a disguised princess. She is wearing silver slippers, everyone whispered. She saved my life, went on the young king. All the people bowed before Singly because they understood that she and none other would be the queen that they had longed for. Martin the shoemaker often wondered on what roads the silver slippers had led his daughter. One day, when he stood on the step of his front porch, um, a long, long caravan came towards the little house. At the head rode Singly, dressed like a queen. Have you become a queen, my child? asked Martin. Did the silver slippers bring this about? This is the reward of a father's love, replied the young king. A father's love is like silver slippers, which guide on bright roads, good roads, and right roads. And so the years went by. Good Queen Singly grew old, but whenever she went in the large kingdom, she left a bright road behind her. And when she died, all the people longed to hear her footsteps again. After that, whenever the elves in the kingdom saw a star fall in the evening, they would call out, See, Queen Singly has gone by but the wicked trolls would run and hide themselves behind fallen trees and large stones. Thanks for reading with me, everybody. Bye.